What up, fans of mixed martial arts? Welcome to another episode of the Calf Kick Experience. Here with your hosts, Zach Zabumafu Gleason and Gage Handlebars Porn Star Hamby. Let's get it, son. Lick it in, baby. Uh, coming to you live from the crib here in Katy, Texas, the Terror Zone, in my onesie, bringing y'all Christmas in May because we were Texas tested last week and lost a little bit of money. This was the first week since we've started doing the calf kick experience that we finished under 500. Even on Reyes v. Prajaka, we broke even. But thankfully, you know what they say, don't bet the house if you don't have the house to play. But we've made money the past couple of fight nights, so... Losing a little bit last weekend doesn't doesn't deter us off path. How's it going, Mr. Hamby Gage, sir, brother? Hey, it's a beautiful day, son. Why don't we get into it? Look, we've been keeping tabs on everything, man. Here's the fight back card from last weekend. I know y'all can't really see it, but uh, yeah, we took a little bit of a hit. So let's, I mean, break it in. Let's start with where we went right, I guess. If anybody's new to this show, let's not make them think we're complete assholes. Let's start with where we hit. Then we'll go <laughs> touch on where we were wrong. Shit, man. I, I went 4-0 to start off our little session last Saturday. And then it went rough after that, son. I feel like we caught some bad luck. Me on the Chunigan fight where I thought she won. Uh, Chunigan lost the decision, but she ended up winning. And Chandler, man, that was a hell of a fight. I thought that should have been stopped from the first. I know you feel the same way, especially since we've been that big on Chandler. Would I have liked for it to have been stopped in the first? Yes, but upon multiple upon multiple rewatches and multiple commentaries and multiple breakdowns of the fight, it's really kind of crazy that Chandler did rock it. Don't get me wrong there. And I absolutely believe that may or may not have been the definition of a 10-8 round. Like, two judges gave it 10-8. I totally thought he won it, delivered a hell of a lot of damage, almost ended it. Should have. I mean, not should have, based on what I'm getting at here, excuse me. But Charlie Olives went into Cobra mode. And I know that Charlie Olives is a disrespectful name, so I'm probably going to drop it, basically, because Chael gave it to him for being an idiot. But now he's the champ. So Charles Oliveira goes into King Cobra mode after Chandler rocks him. On all fours, he's ooh, ooh, dipping and dodging. You cut out there, bud. Anyhow, I guess what he's trying to get at is uh, Oliveira showed a lot of heart. He got in there, he got rocked, worked his way back, and uh, ended up finishing the fight in the second round with a nice left hook. It's just crazy because that's – Definitely something we've seen from Michael Chandler before where he's kind of that dude who's like, let me throw hands. They threw hands. He hit one. Charlie Olives hit one. That's going to be a bad habit to break. Charles Oliveira hit one, but, you know, Oliveira hit him a little bit harder. And I know we kind of touched on the Will Brooks fight last week, but Chandler almost just kind of looked shell-shocked. Like, I don't think he thought Oliveira was going to hit him that hard ever in the, the whole five rounds. No, and that that surprised me. I didn't think Olivero had the ability to rock him like that, you know, and he showed me wrong, and now he's the lightweight champion of the world and probably the toughest division in any promotion. Look, I think Chandler's probably a really fast guy if you put him on one of those treadmills and just let him run. But once you see a guy turn his head and just start hauling ass in MMA, that's probably not a good sign for your bet. No, no shot, bud. That's what I mean. It's like Charlie Charles Charles Oliveira really deserved to win that fight, in my opinion, because of the exchange. They both got rocked. But you see, Charles Oliveira tried to play defense. He composed himself and worked back into the fight after he got rocked. No disrespect to Chandler, because he definitely deserves a top contender at this point still. And he's one fight away from being back in there and fighting for the belt. But you know, he got rocked. And I know we've seen him fight for championships before, but he just kind of looked shell-shocked. Like, he just – he didn't know what to do. He didn't compose himself and start playing defense again. He just took off <laughs> took off running, man. All right, well, let's get into where we went right, pal. Uh, 
read off where we went right off the card. Let me let me let me read it off to you. I'll let you start by rubbing it in my face with that dirty fucking mullet that and Andrea KGB Lee dominated Antonina Shevchenko. I told that you was, so. I mean, told that you. was pure domination. She rocked her. She did on the ground. She showed all facets of the game of mixed martial arts, just complete domination. And that was beautiful to me. No, it was just, it was like taking cough syrup, like real nasty cough syrup when you were a kid, because my whole logic in betting on Shevchenko was that she had been practicing with (laughs) Valentina, the champ Shevchenko. And she literally got finished by the same crucifix that Valentina used to beat Andraz earlier this month. So I'm like, you know... I think Andrea Lee deserves another deal at this point. That was the last fight under contract. She was fighting for a job, and I think she did a good job. I'll give I her that. So too. And I, I'd love to see that, man. I'd like to see her back and see what she can do. Man, make some noise. Andrea Lee. Shout, KGB. Shout, out my, shout out my boy Gage Hamby. Hit him up. He wants to go on a date. Look at that mustache. There's no way you can resist all that. Yeah. <laughs> Where are we going right? Then let's see. We hit right on Andre Munoz. He broke freaking Jacare's arm. That Stop was that bad. shit, son. That Dude. was bad. No, that was like brutal. DC couldn't had to take off his headset. That was so bad. It was brutal, and we you called didn't it. Hear it. We knew that was, was going to happen. I was at a bar, so I didn't actually hear it live on Saturday. But I went back and rewatched it, and you can literally it snapped. Like I wanted to throw up when I saw it sober. Yeah, dude, that was tough. Jock Ray's done. We said that before. He's definitely done now, especially after that injury. See, I never would have thought that that's how he would have lost. I never thought that jujitsu would be the thing, grappling would be the thing that led to his demise. But, you know, that's kind of when you have to hang him up, like you said. When you're getting beat at your own game, it's probably not something you should be doing. CTE, when it's that dangerous. CTE, we already talked about this last week. CK, CT, same difference. Let's see, we also hit on a favorite fighter. Barboozle looked like a beast, dude. Dude, let's Bar- talk about Boozle. that delayed knockout, son. I was watching, I was like, wait, he hit him like 30 seconds ago and he just fell? Like, is he all right? Is he quitting? Nah, dude, he was out on his feet. Like, when they say out on his feet, this is the definition of he was oh, out yeah. on his feet. It was bad. 100%. And it was a domination, too. It wasn't like, you know, like it could have gone to a, a decision. Or it could have, but it wasn't going to go in Bar- or, uh, Shane Burgos's favor. Barboozle dominated that fight. It's just like we said, man. Barboozle was getting in and out, and those leg kicks were devastating. Nasty. That story. dude. That dude knows how to throw a kick. And he talked on Helwani earlier today. I listened to him interview. And he literally said, I could fight tomorrow. The only thing that's wrong with me is that both of my feet are still really swollen from doing all the kicking. He's yeah, like, that dude, that, 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 he made his own legs bleed from kicking the dude so hard. You don't yeah, ever see he that. He made his own chin bleed. Yeah. That was crazy. He and, speaks uh, fine English. It's not his first language for sure. But he said, I look down and I see his leg bleeding. And I said, what I do, I didn't even know it happened. Like he didn't, he thought he cut his leg. Yeah, I mean that was a good fight for us. I I definitely enjoyed that. Went the way that we saw him. That was three in a row for me. Yeah, and then the last one that we hit on on this card, Benil Darouche. That was an ass kicking. Yeah, and that we was- said we called that one too, man. It you can see in in fighting when somebody's on a skid. It goes downhill quick. Tony Ferguson, I like props to him. Toughest, one of the toughest guys I've ever seen in the octagon, especially after him getting his fucking ankle snatched like that in a heel hook and, you know, potentially maybe tearing up his knee. Like that, that was tough and he still battled it out. No, like, like you said, any Brazilian jiu jitsu coach tells you when you get put in a heel hook, doesn't necessarily hurt the worst out of all the submissions it's not going to put you to sleep he's not going to you know snap something to where you're like oh my fuck but 
Getting put in a heel hook will turn your knee into a bucket of bolts. Particularly in that fight, Tony Tony's ankle looked like he had a golf ball under there the whole rest of the fight. He's he's beyond that point where he's hurt. He's injured now. I think the only thing that Tony Ferg has left to do is maybe fight Cowboy again. Not to get back on that fucking bandwagon. <laughs> you don't need fucking to see Tony week. Ferguson fight anybody as dangerous as Benil Darush ever again. It's just not healthy. To the little sidestep here on Benil Darush, I think I want to see him fight Islam Chopovchev where the fuck his name is. I think that would be a good fight. I think they're both tough as nails, and they're both up-and-coming contenders. And they both grapple good as fuck. They Absolutely. both are incredible on the ground. I Look, I figured Benil to win this fight was going to have to knock the fudge out of Tony Ferguson, but, I mean, he out-wrestled him by a mile. I, I guess after he saw the Oliveira win, he was like, why not do the same thing? It ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, but, Tony, man, got his arm based. I don't even know if he actually got it broke versus Charlie Olive, Olives, but it did not look good. Now he got his ankle snatched. Like, like, I don't even know how that guy's walking. I guess he doesn't feel pain. Like, he is tough. Look, him and I, the only thing we shared in common, because he was a jackass to Darush in the fucking press conference. And... You know, I know he was giving him a shot, and he really was doing him a favor, but I was about one or two beers away from tweeting at him and calling him a jackass and hoping that Darush beat his ass. But uh, glad I didn't do that. Sorry, Tony, but... Uh, shit, I forgot where I was even going to go with that. Oh! Oh, Tony Ferg's a jackass, but the only thing we share in common is that when he left the next day, he walks off and says, y'all want me to be done? Hell no. I'm pissed. And that's the same reaction I share to this fucking gambling thing that we've been doing here. Y'all want me to quit because we lost last week, man? Fuck no. I'm pissed. Let's bet the house. Let's do it, son. Let's get into it. Let's so, get into it. You want to start wait, with wait, the wait, prelims? Wait, 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 wait. We got we to gotta discuss a little bit more last weekend about what we got wrong because there was definitely... The Chikugian fight that we didn't like the result on. What are you? What were your thoughts there? We uh, got to keep ourselves honest. We got to admit where we were wrong after we brag about how right we were. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I thought it was a decision win for uh, I forgot her name, something Ari Bayo or can't really. Vivi, Vivian Araujo. Yeah, Araujo. Um, I feel like she did a good job um, <clears throat> on the feet. Even I, I'd say she almost had a 10 8 round before Ch- uh, Caitlin got up and try, kind of flipped the script on that one. But, you know, sometimes when you leave it to the judges, they screw things up in your opinion. But, you know, it is what it is. We lost on that one. Look, it just begs the question now of what do you do with Chikugi? And I know we keep saying her name wrong, and I hate that we do that sometimes, but, uh, you know, she's lost to all of the big dogs, all of the top contenders in that in that division. But every time they throw her in there with an up-and-comer, somebody who's not as good as her, she beats them up. Like, I don't think she beat up Vivi, but she won the fight. And it's like, you know, she's in one of those precarious positions where it's like, what the hell do we do with her now? Where, where, what are we going to do? No, I, yeah, I agree with you. And like I always say, there's levels to this game. The girls, especially, there's a – there's like an upper echelon. They're a lot better than everybody else. And I feel like Chukunigan is somewhere in the middle. You know, she's not terrible. She can't beat the top dogs and she beats on the, you know, the contenders per se. So she's kind of in limbo. Yeah. Then we missed on Matt Schnell. We really thought he was going to get the job done, but man, but, took but it on the flip side to, you know, lessened the loss of this, Bontorian definitely didn't make weight. You don't think? No, he didn't make weight. They said, I mean, he he only missed by a pound, but still. Well, that, fuck that guy. Yeah. I didn't know that. Him. Yeah. No, but he, he looked every bit of bigger and stronger in that fight. You know, he's kind of got that flat-footed walk-him-down style, and it's exactly what he did. 
Yeah, he outclassed them. I mean, that wasn't the biggest beating in the world. It didn't catch my eye by any means of the imagination, but it was also it was kind of boring. I'll give you that. It was I didn't care for it too much. We're being and honest. It also took the place of Jack Manson and Edmund Shabazian, which would have been way better. But that's neither here nor there. I was about to say that's about to save this next card. But final thoughts on UFC 262, Houston, Texas main event: Michael Chandler versus Charles Oliveira. You got anything? I mean, just there. It, it was a great weekend. Like I, I enjoyed all the fights. I thought they were all pretty damn good. You know, there's a lot of knockouts, a lot of submissions. It was very entertaining, except for the Chanel fight. And she, huh. like, you huh. know. Yeah. No, I, 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 the matchmakers did a great job putting that card together. And it's a reason why this next card is kind of shitty. In my opinion. <laughs> Amen. No, uh, it was definitely really cool. I, you know, I, I steal a lot of my ideas from Chael. So if Uncle Bad Guy ever gets a hold of this podcast and decides to get angry, don't call my lawyer just suck it up but uh no he was he was basically telling this story about how Charles Oliveira is from Brazil but not just from Brazil like from the favela like he's from the slums of Brazil and he's already said he's never leaving but he lives in this village where he like buys books for the kids and toys and medicine and he'll fill your car up with gas so like the parade they threw for him bringing the belt back was awesome and as much as that was our big money bet for the weekend and was ultimately why we ended up losing as much as we did, you know, it was a feel good story. I love, I love that kind of idea in sports, but let me, let me pick your brain. Cause I don't imagine that he'll have that belt for very long. There's killers, man. There's killers in the water. Chandler almost did it to him. I feel like Chandler's maybe one max two fights away from another title shot. You got Gaethje. Gaethje's a killer. Gaethje v. Chandler would be dynamite on whatever card. I mean, oh, no, we, we've talked about that. We've talked about Gaethje v. Yeah. Chandler. But people always forget, man, you got a fucking thriller coming up this next month with McGregor versus Poirier 3. McGregor didn't look necessarily good at all in January. It's interesting to see how he'll come back from this. This is his first the loss back. in the UFC since Khabib, right? And I think the Mac is back. I think the Mac might be back. Neither here nor there today. No, we'll get into that later. But uh, <clears throat> it's definitely going to be interesting to see. But people forget how good Dustin Poirier has been. And he could snatch that belt. He's very he's consistent, if he wins, Poirier. If he wins his next fight, he's snatching that belt. So I'm, and I'm putting my money on that. But yeah. uh, just to further your point on Oliveira, Uncle Chael was also talking about Oliver going back down to 145. And I'm not going to lie. That's kind of fucking weak, just like Chael said. That's kind of bullshit. Like, you're the top at 145. Why are you going to go down and be up on the little guys, especially when you've missed weight in that division four fucking times? Don't fucking do that. Go up and challenge Uzman. I mean, this is coming straight from Chael, but I believe it, heart and soul. Don't go down and pick on the little guys when you just beat, beat up everybody in 155. It's not right, man, especially when you can't make weight. You're, I was hoping that you would bring that up, and I wouldn't have to toss that in because I really wanted to talk about that because I like it. And the only reason I like it, I hear the don't pick on the little guy shit, and Charles Oliveira definitely had weight problems, which is ultimately what led him to moving up to 155. But the reason that I think he wants to go back to 145, even at all, I don't know if it's badly. I don't know how badly he wants to do it, but. I think he has unfinished business there. Like, I think the whole narrative going into this fight was how bad he was at 145 and how he revived his career at 55 and won all these fights, and now he's champ. But I think he's got unfinished business at 45. I think he wants to show people I'm the same Charles Oliveira I was however many years ago. I just, you know, had some bad luck, wasn't in the right mind space. I'm here now taking care of my business. You believe – you think I believe that he can beat uh, Volkanovski? Because I don't. Especially at 145. If he gets to be 145, getting to weight is a whole other separate issue. But being Volkanovski, that would be impressive. Volkanovski is a killer. See, I, I like – I would like to agree with you full-heartedly because logic is leading me to say, yes, Volkanovski is a killer. 
But Volkanovski's also kind of built like Michael Chandler, where he's short in stature, kind of bowling ballish. I don't think Charles Oliveira is going to be able to get him in a submission or do any of the stuff we've seen him do. But I think there's a chance that he manages to maintain distance and control his range. And I mean, who knows? I, mean, I never thought on. Charles Oliveira would knock out Michael Chandler. So I'm not counting him out against Volkanovski. Do you know who Volkanovski has defended his twi- title against twice and beat both times? I knew you were going to say Les Holloway, that. son. And he's like, I'd, I'd say almost identical at 145 body style, kind of body composition-wise. And, I mean, it wasn't like he destroyed him, but he definitely won the fight. Like, it's debatable the second one, but the first one, he definitely won. Holloway's a straight-up striker, though. Oliveira has the wrestling defense and the grappling game to at least convince Volkanovski to stand up and strike with him. Like, you don't want to take me down because I'm as, I'm as dangerous as I, as I can be in the octagon on my back from full guard. So let's stand up and fight fire with fire. My last point on this is there's only been one other person that has a belt and gone down to try to obtain a second belt rather than go up and get the second belt. And that would be TJ Dillashaw, who damn near killed himself trying to get to 125. That's, I think weight in this hypothetical scenario we're talking about is the biggest issue. I think Charlie Charles Oliveira making 145 is going to be extremely difficult. And I kind of don't want to see him do it. Like you're saying, from a health perspective, I kind of don't want to see him do it. Nah, I don't think he should. No, I think it's a bad move. And he no, doesn't I think have- for him at this point, his next fight's definitely got to be a title defense at 55. He's yeah, have that- at least one defense before he starts talking about moving weight classes and taking other belts. Also, I don't think he has the chops. I mean, he has the fighting chops to be champion for a long time, but I don't think he's what the UFC is looking for in the champion um, promotion-wise. Well, it's definitely really hard from a promotional standpoint when they don't speak English. No racism involved. But, like, Anderson Silva didn't speak very good English at the beginning, but knew how important it was to getting his face out there and his message out there. And now Anderson Silva speaks fine English. I'm not saying Charles Oliveira has got to go learn English, but, like, like you're saying, to promote somebody in those press conferences that can't take as many questions and stuff because they have to use the translator, it's a little bit more difficult to do, yes. Absolutely. All right. Let's get into this weekend's card, son. Let's talk about it. UFC Vegas 27, Font v. Garbrandt. Starting, we're only touching on mains this week. We're only talking main card. Starting yeah. with Jack Hermanson v. Edmund Shabazian from last just, weekend. Just a little synopsis of this card. Um, like I said, last week's card was banger. They put everybody on that. This week, it's fight night. I think it's on ESPN+, Plus, if I'm not mistaken. Um, besides... Shabazian and Hermanson fight, and then Font versus Garbrandt. This fight has a lot of um, younger people in it, not necessarily age-wise, but also in the UFC. I mean, they got they got up and comers littered with some veterans, but it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how all these newcomers come on. So, well, especially because not, they're not household names, but like you know, Felicia Spencer went the distance with Nunez and I believe Cyborg. Yeah. She, yeah, she I think she went barely lost that fight to Cyborg and that was that was a banger. Yeah, and I mean Carlos Sparza is one fight out from getting a belt shot, you know. But like you're saying, when you put all your eggs into selective baskets and they put on a great fight night earlier in the month with the Usman Masvidal big card. They come around, they put on this big card and then you know we got a massive card coming at the beginning of june on the 12th so is that the mcgregor fight june 12th is adesanya v vittori figueredo v moreno and there's another one on there there's a third belt fight oh no leon v nate diaz got moved there okay it's the it's not even the co-main event anymore and they're keeping it at five rounds nice well, let's uh let's go ahead and get into the uh, first first one here, son. If I Jack Hermanson v. Edmund Shabazian. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we got the odds. So we're coming in with Shabazian at 
plus 135 and Hermans at minus 147. Um, let's take a look at their records. All right, you got him, Hermanson coming in at 6'1", 185, and he's coming in at 21 and 6. <clears throat> as far as fight breakdowns go, you know, he's definitely a tough veteran. There's, there's not an easy out. I mean, he's beat Kevin Gaslam in the past year, lost Ken Near and Vittori, who has a belt fight coming up. And, that that uh, fight with Vittori was a war. It went the distance, and yeah. they—I mean—they beat the shit out of each other. That was a great fight. That was, you know, this is something I always say, but Hermanson is just solid all around. He's not particularly great at any one part of the great game. He's not a particularly great striker. He's very good at it. He's not great on the ground. He's not a great grappler, but he's good at it. I think I think he's high level in terms of transitioning from grappling into submissions and into sub and from submissions into positions where he can create offense. But like you said, with the stand-up game and the striking, Hermanson's like a very awkward boxer. Like he doesn't do things the way that you train them to be done. And on the, on the other hand, Edmund Shabazian is a world-class kickboxer. He's technical as they come. So I think something – it's like when Zach Grinke pitches for the Astros and he throws one over the plate at like 54 miles an hour and it just disrupts the timing. I think something about Hermanson being a little bit more awkward and a little bit more average, kind of like you said, is going to work him past Shabazzian here. Yeah, let's take a look at uh, – let's take a look at Shabazzian and what he's done over the course of his career if this will load. He just lost to Derek Brunson like nine months ago. That was his last fight. I know that one. And the Golden Boy, dude, they were hyping him up to the top degree, man. They were really just, they were trying to push him down the, you know, the train to fucking start him before that loss. Well, um, I mean, think about it. He's our age. He's 23. Yeah, he, he's, he's still got very, so many years to get better. Oh, I'm excited about the prospect of Edmund Shabazian. Yeah, I mean, look, he, he has a win versus Darian. Uh, Darren Stewart, who's no slouch by any means of the imagination, and uh, that was the the ultimate fighter finale. That's crazy. Yeah, and but like he got dominated on the ground by Derek Brunson. Uh, you seen that Derek Brunson? That kind of became his mo, especially after or going into the um, fight with Kevin Holland. You know, yeah, it's not that's not any disrespect to Edmund Spajan. He's a very good stand up, has some knockout power. So I think this is going to be interesting. I'm, I wonder if Hermanson's game plan is kind of use his size. Because I feel like Edmund Spajan, even though he's 185, he's a little smaller, you know, girth-wise uh, compared kind to – Kind of like Kevin 90. Holland at 185. Yeah, I, I agree with that. He's 185, but, like, he's a little bit smaller than the rest of the guys. Kind of, kind of skinny. Yeah, I, I take that. No, I've teetered back and forth on this because I've heard people say, oh, I think Edmund's going to catch him and knock him out. But from my perspective, even though Jack Hermanson is not the same type of wrestler that Derek Brunson is, he's not nearly as strong as Derek Brunson is. No but sure. I think he's going to – I think at first he's probably going to throw some strikes. He's going to find his rhythm on the feet. But I think somewhere in that second round he's going to find a way to get him on the ground and – you know, I don't think Shabazian's very good on the ground. We saw that against Brunson. But against Brunson, Brunson's a ground and pound guy, and Hermanson's a submission guy. So I think we end up seeing a rear naked choke in the second round for Hermanson. Uh, I'm agree. I, I think this one's a lot more of a toss-up than I'd like to normally think just because. But I have to agree with you. I think Hermanson uh, is, is better in stature in the UFC is going to get him passed. Especially with – go ahead. Go ahead. No, you uh, I was just going to say, you know, I there was a lot of deficiencies in the ground game and grappling game of Shabazi. And I think especially at that big of a weight, it's a lot tougher to be deficient in that category. I mean, from Hermanson's perspective too, there's got to be a little bit of extra motivation because even though he's ranked like – what number six now at 185 at middleweight mm -hmm. his last fight was against Vittori and look where Vittori's at now in the title fight well, so if Hermanson turns around and whoops Shabazi in here it's like 
you know, I barely lost to Vittori. I need to fight a top five guy. I need to fight a contender. And, you know, he might be two, two fights out from a title shot if he strings together a couple of wins. Absolutely. If you go back before that fight, you know, Hermanson was looked at as one of the top contenders that was going to maybe next in line if he beat uh, Vittori for a title fight. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe Vittori stepped in short notice, too. I believe that, that was, was Kevin Holland. That was supposed to be a Kevin Holland fight, I believe. Oh, interesting. I think. I might be wrong on that, but... Or regardless, here. I can't remember. Regardless, I think we're both pretty set on Hermanson here. And he's at, what is he at? His odds, let's go check. What is this website called? Best Fight Odds we've been using. Shout out, Best Fight Odds. Shabazian is plus 135, and Hermanson's minus 147. So for a favorite, those, for a favorite, those are pretty favorable odds. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh, go ahead and move on. Next, we have... David Dovrak, the Undertaker. David Dvorak. Yeah. Uh, coming at 19-3 and three versus – help me up on this one, son. I know the last name's Paiva is how you say it, but Raulian Paiva is what I'm going to go with. So are they, are they fighting at 125 or 135? Cause 125, I believe. Okay, that's, this is going to be a little tough for him, Paeva, to make weight, in my opinion. He had trouble the last fight out at uh, flyweight. Look at his record. Um, he's coming in at, what, 20 and 3? Definitely, you know, a veteran, especially coming in at age of 25. He's a lot taller. He's definitely a fighter. Yeah, yeah. He uh, He's three inches taller than Dovac, but he likes to stand there. Um, I think Dovac's going to take this. He's very fast, very fast. He's coming in at 19-3, you know. No no big names here. Like we said, these are up-and-comers, but I think he Bruno has Bruno Silva's no slouch. Bruno Silva's fighting in the prelims underneath, and he's no slouch by any means. I actually like Bruno Silva and his fight, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. No, my fun fact I told you earlier about Dvorak is that he used to be a professional chess player before he was a mixed martial artist. So all that goes to show you, not that it means anything other than he's not all mush in the brain. There's going to be some strategy and there's going to be some game plan going into this fight. So like you said, he's got very quick hands, but I don't see a bunch of knockout power from either of them. I see this going to decision, but I, I, I'm agreeing with you on the fact that weight's probably going to be an issue for Paiva and Dvorak probably going to win by decision. By decision. Yeah, I mean, Dvorak is – or not Dvorak. Oh, he's going to have a disadvantage, I think, in the natural weight, especially after they bulk up after the fight. And there's a three-inch height uh, difference. I'm not sure how big the reach difference is. But I didn't – see when I watched uh, Paeva, I didn't see anything special. I didn't think he had knockout power. You know, he kind of stands there still, walks you down. I think, you know, Dvorak comes – darts in, darts out fast, fast hands. I think he gets it done. Easy does it. All right, son. Let's move next on. We got, next we got Felicia Spencer versus Norma Dumont. Yeah, Spencer coming in at 30 years old, coming at 8-2. and two. I mean, look at this. The only loss is to Amanda Nunes and Cyborg. Yeah, and they, they both went the distance. Both went to decisions. And like She's you tough. said, like you said before we started, she – may or may not have won that cyborg fight. Yeah, I mean, she's tough, no doubt. I mean, if you go the distance with uh, Amanda Nunes, you, you're no slouch. You you get it done. And she's built like a brick house, son. I mean... So she's a true 145-er, that's for sure. I was just yeah. getting ready to say that. And she has a good ground game. She can take a shot, though, man. Um, I, I think it's interesting because you don't see these fights at 145 very often. I mean, the only times you usually see them is with you know, Amanda Nunes. So this is this is very interesting. And going over to her opponent, Norma Dumont, she's actually pretty good herself. Um, no, she's she's definitely – Norma Dumont is definitely a very good stand-up fighter. She's definitely a good striker. Her yeah. boxing is high level, and her kickboxing is also very good. They do have a common opponent. They 
she lost to Megan Anderson and uh, Felicia Spencer beat her. So I think uh, I think Spencer gets this done because she's a veteran. She knows what she's doing. She's been in the top of the top beat or not beat, but done the distance with two of the best women of all time, in my opinion. And uh, I don't I don't necessarily think Dumont can take it. Um. I guess the constant that I want to use here is Megan Anderson, not because they share her as an opponent so much as Megan Anderson is a very long, tall, rangy striker for 145. And not to say that Norma Dumont's that same kind of body style, but that's the same kind of fight she's going to want to fight. And I think if we look back at what Amanda Nunes was able to do to Megan Anderson, I don't think Felicia Spencer is as capable on her feet striking as Amanda Nunez by any means, but I think she's a very good wrestler. I think she's going to get Dumont on the ground early. And I think often throughout the fight, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a TKO, like a ground and pound TKO from a crucifix or something, but I could also see this one going all the way. Regardless, I'm with you. I think Felicia Spencer is going to get it done. Yeah. And we agree on that one. That's pretty solid. Moving along here, let's go on to Justin Taffa. Uh, Justin Taffa, bad man. Dude, I always get him confused with the uh, Tui Taivasa. Tai Tui Vasa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's coming out. They both have that same kind of like uh, Hawaiian tat, like not Hawaiian. Island, like uh, Samoan. Yeah. Yeah. Like the tattoos that are real dark and there's a bunch of stuff real close together. Yeah, those are cool. Uh, yeah, he's coming at four and two, coming off a loss. But you know, he got he has mad power, man. This guy hits like a train. Uh, <laughs> if there was that one fight there, versus Carlos Felipe was actually very close, very competitive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Tapa looked like a brick house in that fight. They literally met in the middle of the ring and just traded shots at one point. And I thought that. ESPN MMA had posted this clip to Instagram to show off Tapa, which I suppose they did. But when you're, I watched five different clips of it from five different angles, and you can see Felipe hit him in the face harder than fuck, I guess. Harder than <laughs> anybody needs to be standing after they get hit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, his opponent. Is, yeah, take me to the other side because yeah, Jared, Jared Bandera, Bandera is man. not very good. Do what? He's not very good. <laughs> Coming out eleven and five, bro. These these boys are built like brick shit houses. Um, he's coming off loss as well against Sergey Spivak. You and know. he got his Spivak beat his ass. That was that wasn't even very fun. Yeah, but, and he has a win versus on. He has a win versus Harry Hunsucker, and, and he fought recently, and he got fucking destroyed. He looked like he was out of his league. So. Sure. I think we're both going to take uh, Justin Toffa here, and I think it's going to be chaos. I bet KO on this one, son. I don't know about a cold KO, but definitely a TKO. I don't think this fight's going to go all the way. Just because Vandera's a very big guy. Like, he's touching the top weight limit for heavyweight. Yeah. And he doesn't move very well. Tapa's also a big guy. You know, he'll be noticeably shorter and probably have a reach, reach disadvantage. But he moves his head very well. He doesn't get hit as much as Vandera. He's the quicker guy. I just, you know, when you're that big and that strong, you're not taking a bunch of punches. And no, and I think – Talk I, about it. Yeah, I think Tafa, you know, you get you get clipped by overhand right or left. I think he's southpaw, so I think if you get clipped by his overhand left, you're fucking out cold, son. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't really – guys, we really don't have much to talk about here. I mean, these, these matchups aren't really great. And I know we're picking a bunch of his favorites here, but it's just whoa, like, whoa, whoa! But we're gonna win this weekend. That's we the best are. part. We're gonna win this sweet week. Sweet ass, we're gonna fucking win this week, even if we're taking the fucking favorites. So let's move into this main, this co-main event: Jan Jaunan versus Carlos Sparza. Thank you for saying that, because I did not want to try to say that. I had to yeah. look it up, but. That was the one that I decided I was not going to say wrong because I have no disrespect for the Chinese people and the fighters that they put out there. 
no, they're they're very very good. Coming in at thirteen and one in the strawweight division, uh, she's five five one fifteen, and she has Claudia Gedele on her fucking car. That's a that's a good name. You have Angela Hill as Angela well. Hill? Yeah, I mean these are solid names. But if you look, these are all decision wins. You know, I'm not gonna go into detail about how she won all of these because that's just a waste of time. No, for sure. But uh, she definitely has her hands full this week with Carla Sparza, 17 and six. You know, also strawweight division, obviously. But you know, look at these names. She has Marina Rodriguez, Michelle Waterson, Alexa Grasso. She's lost Claudia Gadelia, however. Lost to Randy Marcos. Is a, is a good name to have on there as well. But she's a fighter. Look at this. She, she's lost to Yana, but she beat Rose, the champion. You know, yeah. uh, I. I actually like uh, Carlos Bars in this one. I know you don't, but... Uh, I was about to say, it's funny because it seems like more and more that we do the research and do this by the numbers, the more that we end up picking very similar fight cards, but there's always got to be one. We can't ever draw on a weekend. One of us has to win. You won last weekend with Andrea Lee, and I'm going to take this weekend with Jan Jaunan. Yeah, I'm going to take Carla Esparza. I think she has very clean ground game, and she knows how she – she she has the fight go her way. She doesn't work in a way that doesn't suit her uh, skills. So I think Carla Esparza is going to take her down, ground the pound, do that kind of thing. Just do her game, man. No, I think on the flip side of that coin, Jan Janan is a very high-level striker. But like you said, Carla Esparza definitely has the wrestling advantage. But where I think it is interesting is I've seen Yao Z or Yan Zhaonan get in these weird positions where she's on her back, but she can create offense from her back. She can cut up with the elbows. And I've everything. seen that too, yeah. I, I like that. But you're also talking to a ground specialist in Carla Esparza, in my opinion. And okay. she, she's very good at controlling – the lower body, getting into half guard and all that jazz, where she's not going to take those elbows and she's going to neutralize that um, offense from the bottom, in my opinion. No, I definitely think that we're probably both going to agree that, you know, we're going to talk prop bets and side bets in a second, but just to give you a freebie and a sneak peek, I think we can both probably agree that this fight is going to go the distance. This is probably going to be decided by the referees. Absolutely. What's the uh, overall odds on this fight? Um, let's go check it. We got Carla Esparza at plus 108 and Jan Jaunan at minus 118. So it's very close. And that's the co-main, right? That's co-main, yeah. Co that's second to last. I think, honestly, I, I originally thought that Jack Hermanson versus Shabazian should have been the co-main. But the way that this card plays out, you have them kicking off the show. Then you have Felicia Spencer. So you got a name somewhere in the middle. Then there, I think this is going to be a very good fight, a very competitive fight. So you're going to have a great co-main event. Let's just toss it up. Let's just lead into the main event. I think we're going to have a great fight here on our hands. I think Your this thoughts. is going to be a banger. I, I particularly like the 135 and 155 division for the most action. Uh, I think both those divisions just have – they have dynamite athletes in them. They're the, both, like, the hottest um, on-fire divisions, in my opinion, for the UFC especially. Um, Cody, no love, Garbrandt, the underdog, I believe. Look, dude, this is about as close as it, as, as it gets. Yeah. I saw both Esparza and Jan Jaunan and then Garbrandt Vifont at the beginning of this week open as pick -ups. So when you look at it, money on the fight we just talked about is going in on Jan Jonan, but money in the main event is going in on Rob Font because Garbrandt is a slight underdog at plus 101 and Rob Font's at minus 109. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I like no love here. No love Garbrandt. I think, you know, he's he doesn't fight nearly as often as I think any of his fans would like. He came off a three-fight skid. Um, leading up into his last fight with Rafael Asuncao and that beautiful KO. He just showed how masterful his defense and his speed and the speed of his hands was and the knockout power. 
I think he gets it done, but it's going to be a banger because Rob Font also likes to throw heavy hands. I just think uh, Cody just has more defensive skill when it comes to the kickboxing aspect. Look, I'm about to pull a stunt, and I'm sure everybody's already caught me red-handed because I wasn't very sneaky about it. I'm about to pull the first headgear change mid-show in calf kick experience history because I hammered down on the American Michael Chandler last Saturday. You know he didn't get it done for me, but I'm with Gage this week, and in Lee Corso fashion, I'm picking Cody Garbrandt, putting on the red, white, and blue because – I think this fight at a different weight division is going to look very similar to Calvin Cater versus Max Holloway. I think, you know, this is probably going to sound stupid because Rob Font trains with Calvin Cater. You know, they run it, they box together up in New England, but uh, in Boston, actually. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of people give Cody shit about not covering his face and not putting his hands up to play boxing defense, but Cody Garbrandt's biggest asset is that, like you said, he's quick, and there's a lot of ways to do boxing defense, and the way that Cody does it is, like I said, Charles Oliveira did, Cobra style, reflexes. He's moving Mm -hmm. his head. He doesn't get hit a bunch, but the problem with Cody is that when he does get hit, he gets hit very hard. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't see that coming from Font. I don't see that happening from Rob. No, I, I I think you're 100% right. I think we both nailed it on, it on the head. Fucking hammer Don. Let's fucking get it here, son. That's a wrap for the UFC card. Let's get into some other stuff here, you know? Yeah, I was let's, about to say, let's, let's talk about... I guess we got Chris Cyborg this weekend in Bellator. Absolutely. Chris Cyborg hey. at Women's 145. If you're looking for some action this weekend, I think I think this is the best action, in my opinion, on uh, the Bellator card. We are going to go over here to fight odds, girl up. Yeah, we got, obviously, Bel- um, Cyborg minus 1,000 favorite, huge favorite here. And I can blame you, man. I think, <laughs> I think she's going to destroy Leslie Smith. Cyborg is just leagues above any other woman not named Amanda Nunes. At uh, at that weight division of 145, I believe, and dude, <laughs> fuck it. I know it's gonna get some shit, but she is the female version of Vanderlei Silva. <laughs> she <laughs> is built like a man, son. You did not just say that, <laughs> bro. She she looks like more of a man than me with this goddamn handlebar mustache, son. Chris Cyborg is going to kick your ass. <laughs> Please don't come. I hope she gets stuck at the fucking border. I was about to say, I feel like the more and more we do this show, the more and more we have to ask for people not to come kick our asses. <laughs> like this week, we're already up at Chris Cyborg will be at your door while Tony Ferguson's fucking ground and pounding me at my house. <laughs> hey, bro, I don't know what kind of Brazilian supplements they got down there, but she on all of them. There's no way a woman looks like that. I'm sorry, bro. No, I just, I, I definitely think, I, I mean, you know, I don't want any part of minus 1,000 action. So you got to no. throw Cyborg in a three-fight parlay if, if you want anything to do with that. But, you know, that, like the odds that say. Wasn't like, that wasn't necessarily that, in my opinion, that's not the best action. The, the other fight we're about to speak about. No, 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 no. It'll, I think it'll be action. I think Chris Cyborg will show us some blood. I think he'll beat the oh, fuck yeah. out of her. I think it's a, it's a lock. Like, that's a lock. I don't think Chris Cyborg's losing. I mean, that was almost as, as solid as betting on Trevor Lawrence to be the first pick in the draft. Right? Yeah, pretty much. But uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I'm sure you agree with me. No, I listened to her talk today, too. She was on Helwani, and she just sounds like a much better Chris Cyborg than what we saw in the UFC. Like, I'm sad that those relations were spoiled and she ended up moving promotions because she's 35. She's definitely moving towards the end of her career. But, you know, she sounds happy. She sounds healthy. She's talking about maybe having a kid of her own because they have a daughter that they've adopted. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think she's going into this fight thinking, I'm a badass. There's nobody in Bellator women's MMA that can beat me. So, yeah, there's nobody. I just got to go do my thing. I don't yeah. think there's any nerves or anything about defending that belt and putting it up on the line. And like you said, I think that's just a lot. 
All right. Now, the best action of the weekend, in my opinion here, is we have Austin Vanderford, otherwise known as Paige Van Sant's husband, lucky bastard, versus Fabian <laughs> Edwards. Fabian Edwards, the younger brother of Leon Edwards. Um, dude, plus 204 is looking mighty juicy to me. Um, I, Fabian Edwards? Yeah, son. I think I think Edwards is going to get it done. I've seen some of his work, dude. He has it all. He's I, – I, and side note, he's 185 as compared to Leon at 170. But uh, I think this is a good test of, against an undefeated fighter in Austin Vanderford, I might add. But I've seen an all-around game from uh, Fabian Edwards, man. I think he's good. I think he, he's coming off of a lose a loss. It was a decision, but he has electric stuff, man. He's an athlete, flying knees, arm bars, all that shit. He has it. I love to hear it. I, I Look, I didn't even know until we were talking about doing this show about an hour ago that Fabian Edwards even existed. But, <laughs> I mean, props to the guy. I love the interpersonal relationship and ties back to the UFC. And, I mean... I'm a fucking fiend for this shit. I love to have something to watch. So uh, you're telling me plus 204 on Fabian Edwards? Hammer down. Hammer down, son. Hammer Lord. down, son. <laughs> All right. One other note to note about Fabian Edwards is the mainstream might start might start hearing about him pretty soon. This is the last fight on his Bellator contract, and he wants a title fight, and he said after this if he wants, of course. If he does win, I think he might get it. But he said there's going to be contract negotiations. I could see UFC coming in and swooping in and stealing him from the UFC and putting uh, Fabian Edwards on their roster. Look, I, I haven't seen the guy yet. So no, don't let me disrespect anybody, especially because Tony Ferguson in tandem with this dude whooping my ass probably wouldn't be too favorable of a position for me. But – and it's not – Never mind. I just, I think that at 185, Bellator doesn't seem to have a lot of players. So if he can get over on the on Paige Van Zant's husband, I wouldn't mind seeing him fight a top contender. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily want him to call for Michael Venom Page, but I wouldn't hate it if Douglas Lima was tied up. No, they fight 170, not 185. Oh. Fuck me raw. This thing, this damn wig squeezing my head too tight. All right. Well, uh, I think that's all we got for this week, folks. Uh, I was about to say, we got to we gotta run down. We got to do our last minute championship rounds. Five minutes of just spewing it. All right, son. Start us off. Ready? ready? I got the timer on my phone. Five minutes. Let's run it. So... What do you think about John Jones got back on Twitter? I know we haven't talked about him yet, and he's a pretty strong possibility to, you know, if you were betting on our show that we would bring him up. But talking about going to meet with lawyers just recently, you think he's threatening the UFC in some facet? Um, I wouldn't necessarily – I don't think he threatened threaten the UFC, bro. They basically own Saturday nights, kind of like the NFL owns Sundays. Um, big shocker there, but USC has a lot of money. I don't think there's anything John Jones could do um, that would change USC's mind about how much they want to pay him, which, yeah. I mean, is a ridiculous amount. Uh, Connor's not even made that much in the purse before. I mean, in the UFC, of course, but he made that in boxing. But um, I just don't see that necessarily grabbing the UFC's attention. But on the flip side, Dan White was talking about Lewis being Gano too, which I know we're both not fond of necessarily coming coming from the first fight. But let's talk about Lewis. I mean, I think we definitely see a much better fight the second time. I think we definitely yeah. see a much different fight the second time. But tell me yeah. about Lewis. But Lewis, I don't know if you've seen headlines, but this week somebody tried to jack his van. <laughs> and that this was awesome. Time, this son of a bitch picked the wrong guy to try to steal his car. He subdued subdued him. Um, I'm guessing with his right hand, and uh, poor bastard got thrown thrown in jail. He deserved it. Not he's not poor, but kind of unfortunate that he picked 
you know, the heavyweight number one contender to, you know, fuck with. Well, especially because the headline, like you said, did not say that Derek subdued him. It said that he knocked him out. So <laughs> there was no chokehold. There was no let me restrain you. It was like you said, a right hand to the temple, and this guy went night night till the cops showed up. And that guy was like maybe 165 pounds soaking wet. He was not big. Son of a bitch. Derek was that's, like, oh, I get to beat up a little guy. This is awesome. That's freaking hilarious. I love that. Uh, you see that thing I texted you about earlier? That There's more TikTokers and YouTubers that are looking to get into boxing now. Tana Mojo is a girl YouTuber who wants to fight Bella Thorne now. I'm like, as much as Jake Paul definitely surprised me on Chael and then, you know, definitely has shaken up the industry in a, in a facet, in a way of like, you know, he signed, signs one fight deals. He doesn't sign multiple fights, multiple fight deals. He's not committed to, to Triller. Mm-hmm. I just mean boxing was a joke about a year ago, two years ago, but boxing, I mean, they're making a mockery of this shit now. Yeah, I mean, boxing was dead. It's been dead since, I mean, I guess before, I think the death of boxing, in my opinion, besides, you know, Fury and Deontay Wilder was after Manny Pacquiao fought fought, um, Mayweather. Hold on. We got short time, but did you see that shit with, with Tyson Fury? No. Something in their contract, I haven't looked at it yet, and I'm trying to go to law school in the fall, so I should probably look into this a little bit further and be more knowledgeable on the topic. But they had signed a two-fight deal, Fury and Deontay Wilder. They were always going to fight twice. That was always the plan, regardless of the you know win-loss. But there was some sort of rematch clause written into that contract that Deontay Wilder exercised, and they took it to arbitration. So, you know, they've been trying to figure out the date and the place and set up Joshua v. Fury. Mm -hmm. The arbitrator and the legal, the court, said Tyson Fury has to fight Deontay Wilder again by September 15th. Holy fuck. Soon. Oh, shit. That's not good. I don't think Tyson Fury wants to do that. I think think he got out, even though he won by KO, I think he got out kind of unscathed. Well, I know for a fact that Tyson Fury is partying it up right now, and he's not in shape to go step into a boxing match with Deontay Wilder. However, you know, it would probably be a pretty large sum, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of under-the-table money that got Deontay Wilder to drop his suit so they could go ahead and do business with Anthony Joshua. Boxing is just a whole other can of worms that I don't like to get into. I don't think it's exciting. And especially with these fucking TikToker and YouTube assholes making uh, making a mockery of, you know, once beloved sport. But I'd also love to see these assholes get in the fucking octagon. Because they'd get fucking Amen to that. smashed. Amen to that. With the timer running out, Gage drops a spinning wheel kick to the temple. Gage freaking lays it out. But... Like we said, I think that's all we got. I think that's another episode of the Calf Kick Experience wrapping up. Zach Gleason and Gage Hamby signing out. Let's get it.